Hello everyone, my name is Veikko Sarila, but most of you know me as Pestis of Brainless Coders, and I welcome you to the Love by 2023 seminar called Music in Tiny Intros. Now, what is music? Music, according to Wikipedia, is generally defined as the art of arranging sound to create some combination of rhythm, melody, harmony, and form. So let's pick apart a few of these words. Let's start with the rhythm. The rhythm, to put it simply, it means just notes have finite length and there's also rests and silence too. Melody just means that there are note pitches that vary and harmony means that these pitch intervals the, uh, the ratios between these pitches have been carefully and purposefully chosen. And then form here means simply that this, there's some kind of song structure, there's progression, there's sections in the song, there's key changes, there's chord changes, and there's perhaps even the song ends at some point. So thus, um, I don't consider triggering a single MIDI note too much too musical, nor do I think writing random values to registers um, not very musical. So the, you could consider these as something like soundscapes or maybe just audio, but I don't think that they're much of a music in a tiny intro. So the previous um, definition of music suggests an outline of the talk. So we're going to talk about first starting with the uh, rhythms and timbres of the sounds and then we're going to progress to talking about harmonies and melodies and then finally pro uh, progress all the way to structure and a form and I will end up with talking about something about um, the tools that I've developed to support uh, this kind of uh, uh, musical composition. But before we start I'm going to actually um, review some of the basic considerations you should um, do before you start to uh, compose your piece. I'm not going to target any particular platform. So if you're looking to help, uh, looking for help, how to trigger a MIDI note in x86 or DOS, you're not going to find it here. There are excellent references for that. I'm going to give the links to those in the end of this talk. Um, but that being said, I am going to exemplify uh, the ideas that um, are being developed in, during this talk using the Dolce & Byte Beat tool. So the tool looks like this. So what it, the tool gives you is that you can type in a particular equation in JavaScript or a, or a JavaScript expression and it allows you to hear what it sounds. So it gives you variable t which is the time in the samples. And I have now configured this um, to be at 44.1 kilohertz. And uh, then it evaluates this expression and, and, and um, interprets it as a sample stream and just dumps it to the sample output. Um, I have configured, by the way, this to be float bits. So the sample values are uh, floats uh, in the range from minus one to one. Now, uh, right off the bat, I'm going to do a little trick because this tool expects you to write a JavaScript expression, but to write a complicated musical piece in just a sim single JavaScript expression is a little bit complicated. So I would like to write just an ordinary JavaScript code, like statements and all. So we're going to do a small trick. Um, we're going to write a quick uh, Lambda function, which can return um, some uh, uh, value and let's say assign t divided by 45 2 pi times 400 so this should be a sine wave with the frequency of 400 and then we're just going to call that lambda expression right away so there's a beautiful sine wave and <clears throat> because I don't usually like to work with um, sample time, so we're going to define a variable. Now we can just define like statements, so we're going to define a variable called u, 
which is the time in seconds. Right. So this tool allows us to <clears throat> um, exemplify the, some of the ideas uh, during this talk. Now, before you actually start to make music uh, for tiny intros, there's a few things you should consider. Firstly, what is the audio API of your platform? Audio APIs can be broadly categorized into two major categories. You have this kind of sample stream APIs, which basically just give you a um, ask you to calculate the samples at a certain sampling rate, for example, at 44.1 uh, kilohertz. Or there are what I call virtual instruments. APIs that allow you to trigger notes and control how they sound, but <clears throat> After you've triggered the node, you can almost kind of like forget about its existence. So the next thing you should think about is that what is your size budget? I started this whole journey to the uh, music in tiny intros from 4K intros. And this is a kind of a rule of thumb I heard from first from Gopher and I recently confirmed for Virgil that for a typical 4K intro, the audio, including the synthesizer, synthesizer, data, initialization and deinitialization routines, everything that takes typically something like 1.3 kilobytes, or that will be like 30% of the total. Now, for the purposes of this seminar, I actually went through my old uh, um, intros, and I reviewed how much the sound was if I took away the, um, <clears throat> if I, I, I removed the um, uh, everything else than the things that I've heard uh, song, song data and just kept the initials and the in routines, and I ended up with this kind of number. So in the crackle bass, which was a 512 byte tick 80 intro, the audio took something like um, 205 bytes compressed, so that would be like 40% of the total. In the tubi form, which is a 256-byte intro for DOS. The audio took a whopping 142 bytes, so that would be like 55%. And a Star Trip, which was a 128-byte intro for DOS, the audio took like 59 bytes, so that would be like 46% of the total. So one way to look at these numbers is that tiny intros may have to accept that you, you if you want to really do some something of a music, you might have to accept that that 30% rule that holds for 4K intros is, um, is not quite accurate anymore. So you might have to accept larger percentages for the audio. And in my opinion, if, if, you only can, if the only thing you can afford is like 30% of your 128-byte intro uh, for music, something like 40 bytes, then you should probably start asking yourself, is the intro, does the intro need music or would it be just better to use use it all for visuals? But note that these values are a bit are a bit pessimistic. The the initialization and initialization you're already doing some work that can be reused when you start adding your visuals in, so you can reuse some of the init codes. And also, once you have music, you can actually add. Um, syncs to the music, usually quite cheap. So you just, in the music synthesizer code, you, for example, uh, you dump the um, envelopes, for example, of the different notes to different uh, parts of the visuals to get syncs. Or you could have um, the different parts of the intro change with the music. So meaning that um, even though that this is nominally all of the these bytes are allocated for audio, it will actually also help you to make your visuals more interesting. So the last thing I think that is worthwhile to consider is that what is your approach to making music? 
And broadly speaking, I think that the approaches to make music for tiny interest can be categorized into two extreme ends. We have the bottom up approach, which is about typing in just random equations and listening how they sound. And then you have the top down approach, where you start with the musical idea and fill in details later. So the bottom approach is essentially what could be considered the byte beat approach. You basically use whatever instructions, you use whatever operators, whatever data functions you have available, you dump them to the sound output and you listen how they sound and you hope if they sound good. And if you find something that you uh, like, then you keep it and then you add more stuff. So the tiniest music is always like this. The tiniest programs that create music are always like this because you use some equation that is definitely not meant to be just dumped to the audio output and, and, and somehow mysteriously find something that sounds good. The nice thing about this kind of approach to making music is that it practically always fits. Because if you have a certain size budget, you just keep on adding stuff until you're out of bytes. And once you are out of bytes, maybe if you're a little bit out of bytes, you try to hack it in. If you're not, um, if you can't hack it, hack everything to fit, you just sort of roll back to the previous version. However, this is also makes it very difficult to engineer this kind of sounds. Because if you change one value in one of your equation, you get completely different sounds. Then there's this top-down approach. This is basically that you start with a musical idea, you start big, you don't worry about size coding at all at first, but you implement your idea. And then you start op optimizing and simplifying and, and reducing features until it fits your size budget. And if ByteBeat is usually like equation driven, here you actually, because you, you clearly know what kind of a musical idea you want, it's usually easier to start with data-driven approaches. So you uh, have your note patterns in, in, in arrays, or you have uh, your order list in arrays, and so on. So it's a lot easier to shape your sound and engineer it um, and compose music with this kind of approaches. However, the problem here is that there's actually no guarantee that it'll actually fit in the end. So you might have started too big and you will not able to squeeze you will not be able to squeeze it into the size budget that you have. So now we are ready to start with the first part of this. So we want to have some kind of timbre, some kind of notes with tonal quality, and then we start to make some kind of rhythms out of these notes. But before we can actually make rhythms, we need something of a simple note, a simple sound, and the tried and true ways to make uh, notes electronically is to have an oscillator, oscillating at a relatively high frequency, and then multiplied by an envelope, which is a relatively slowly changing um, function that defines the overall shape of the note. So we can do simple functions, simple envelopes that just take a time I put this time to go from zero to one here. And you need something that is starts sharp and then decays slow to zero or close to zero. So the simplest possible envelope you can imagine is just the gate. So it's, it's on for a certain time, but then it turns off. But this already helps a lot. So if you, all you can do is gate, then please do a gate because this allows the listener to, to separate each note from each other already. Next up, you can do just simple linear envelopes. Um, a lot of the stuff I've done in Tiny Intros is just using linear envelopes. So about the oscillators, the usual suspects are there. You can do square waves, you can sawtooth, you can do sine waves, you can distort the sine waves, um, for example, to raising them to a certain power, or you could take the absolute value of sine waves, or you could do noise. So maybe something worthwhile to mention here is that square waves are nice because they really avoid the multipli multiplication. If your platform does not have a mul instruction, uh, you don't have to do any um, you don't have to do any kind of a multiplication for square wave 
because you can just um, it, it just goes from zero to between values of zero to one. So basically, zero is multiplied by zero is always just zero, and multiplied by one, the envelope multiplied by one is always just the envelope value itself. So you avoid the mool when you when you use square ways. Okay, so let's cook something up in the byte beat tool. So <clears throat> I had the u there. So let's put the row. Row, I mean, I use a term familiar to <clears throat> um, tracker musicians. So the row, I'm going to have like uh, my patterns are going to be two rows per second. So this will be time in rows. And then V, R is the row. So V will going to be the... Um, time within the row. So it's just the row modulo one. So that is the position goes from zero to one. And now we're going to calculate the envelope based on V. So it's, we're going to use, let's say one minus V. So it's like a linear envelope. Let's put a frequency of 600, the oscillator equal to sine of F time, um, the time and actually, this is this is probably the angular frequency. So it's not free 600 hertz. I just probably put the um, two factor of two pi somewhere there. But because I'm I'm not going to care about a being um, 440 or anything like that. So I don't really care about what those frequency units are really are. And then we can just do just uh, envelope times oscillator is our output. So let's hear how it sounds. So immediately we have some kind of a pulse going on. We have uh, we can hear the underlying pulse of our soon-to-be song. So it's a sine wave going at two times a second or 120 BPM with a linear envelope. Okay. So. I'll just show you with the visualization. The sound ain't going to be very interesting, but I'll just show how the envelope looks like in the in the visualizer. So this is just a little bit. Um, it's just linear envelope. Okay. So let's try something else. Let's try a um, exponential envelope. works quite nice, but it doesn't quite decay close to zero uh, by the time the next note uh, or the next note starts. So we're gonna multiply V with a certain factor. Let's put seven. So we have something that starts to um, Sound something that we could use to make rhythms. But there's a little bit of annoying click there because of the, um, <clears throat> when the envelope kicks, it kicks all the way, um, immediately attacks to the number of one, one. So let's add a small factor of um, point, uh, zero, 0.01 divided by V. So what this factor does is that when V is very close to zero, so when we are at the beginning of the note, this small factor here is going to be huge and two to the power of uh, um, minus one, um, so two to the power of negative, large negative number will be very close to zero. So this smooths out the envelope. I can show you how the envelope looks like in the visualizer. So we have a relatively sharp attack and a slow decay and 
there's not too much uh, clicking in the sound. All right. So, <clears throat> so how do we make these sounds a bit more interesting? So I'm just going to show you one way, but which I find one of the best bangs for the buck kind of ways to make interesting sounds in soft synthesizers, and that is additive synthesis. So <clears throat> in additive synthesis, you basically, once you have this one envelope and one oscillator running, you just put a huge number of these ones in parallel and and add, and add their, their outputs up to a uh, one waveform. These um, separate oscillators are, are called partials. And um, in some definition of additive synthesis, uh, they are assumed to be pure sine waves. And the oscillators are usually running at integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. of the, So if the first oscillator is running at the frequency f, then the second oscillator is typically running with the frequency 2f, and the next one with the 3f, 4f, and so on and so on and so on. And about those envelopes, usually it sounds better if you make the envelopes of the oscillators running with higher frequencies to decay faster. That represents physically like these, these oscillators that are oscillating with a higher frequency would um, dissipate their energy more quickly. That's how they work in, in, in nature. And that usually tends to sound better in practice. So let's add some additive synthesis uh, to our byte beat. So <clears throat> instead of returning the, the value from one oscillator, we're going to make a um, sample output x, which we accumulate sorry, um, over, all, uh, over all these different uh, oscillators. We're going to make a for loop. Let's make nine oscillators in parallel. And in each of these ones, we're going to add up the output of this to the x, and we return x. And <clears throat> let's make these oscillators run at integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. So we just multiply it by the f by i here. So the first oscillator is running at the frequency of f, and the next one is running at the frequency of 2 times f, and then next one three times f, and so on. So let's hear how this how this thing sounds. Okay, I think there's a bit of a... So it already sounds a bit more in interesting, like this. There's a lot more harmonics going on. Okay? But now what we can do, I said that we, it's probably we want to make the um, oscillators running at higher frequencies to dig a bit faster. So we could, this, this, this term over here in the envelope was controlling the rate of decay. So we're going to just multiply by that one by i. And now I think it's kind of decaying quite fast. So let's... Um, adjust the co uh, constants in front. And we have something that already star starts to sound a lot more interesting than it used to sound before. So now what we can do, so now what we can do is that we, <clears throat> we give these different partials, different weights. And we could just calculate something based on the i. So we could just give them sine i. This is, is, is almost like a random number depending on the on the partial index of the partial. And we just multiply. Now we 
are finally ready to do some rhythms. And the way we're going to do, do rhythms here is that we already have the row. It's the variable R here. And we're just going to either have a note, trigger a note, or not trigger a note. So we're going to make an array of, let's say, with the length 8. And then we're going to take the um, row and 7. You know, tried and true trick for them um, for getting it as an integer and also to get it as a model of eight. This is a bit slow. Let's 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 make the rows move faster so you can hear the rhythm a little bit better. So, we have a simple rhythm driven by these kind of arrays. Now, you might notice that I actually control the frequency using the tables. So, I have a table of ones and zeros. So, I use actually the fact that when I set the frequency to zero, of course, this, this f times i times u in the oscillator here will be always zero, and then sine of zero will be zero, so the output will be zero. So this will, the zero here, when I set the frequency to zero, it will guarantee that the output will be exactly zero. But uh, the reason I put the table over here is that that is sort of a, that is sort of a preparing us to the next part, which is that we're going to discuss harmony and melodies. So the, <clears throat> the first question usually you should ask yourself is that how are you going to store your note data? Assuming that you want to store everything as integers because Integers, integers are much more um, compact. So basically, you have two options. You can store your node data logarithmically as semitones, meaning that you calculate the frequency of that you're going to play as being some c, constant c times 2 to the power of your integer node data divided by 12. Or you can store the node data linearly, so meaning that the frequency is just some constant c times the frequency value that you've stored in the data. So the logarithmic node data basically means that you've tuned all your frequencies according to the 12-tone equal temperament. And it's very nice because you can actually cover many octaves very easily. So it's also natural for musicians because they're used to this kind of um, notation and representation. And it's easy to integrate into existing tooling. So if you have, let's say, a MIDI file, all the node data will be represented using 12 total equivalent temperament, the MIDI node values, and thus <clears throat> um, it's easy to pull these values, for example, from MIDI files. Also, this is the natural way to store your node data if this is what your audio API accepts. So if your audio API accepts uh, the node values in uh, semitones, then of most natural, you probably want to store your node values like this. However, there are a few problems with this one, especially if you're writing your own soft synthesizers. The Poe operator here. In JavaScript, that's fairly compact. However, not all languages have the POV operator. So not all languages have the, even a POV function. Not all uh, assembly, uh, archi not all uh, platforms have anything going on of an instruction that even can be used to compute this PO. So even on NX x87, I think it takes something like 14 bytes to do 2 to the power of a floating point value. 
So it's costly. And the another problem with this kind of representation is that if you use zero, for example, to encode silence, it always needs a special treatment. So if you put zero there, that's not going to give you a frequency of zero here. So you need special treatment to the to to um, to treat zero as silence. Now with linear node data, the advantage of this one we already saw before is that when you put a zero to the frequency, it always um, if your oscillator start with zero, it encodes nice rest or silence, and you don't need the Paul um, instructor operator. And <clears throat> The, one of the you know the good and the bad things is that um, some of the frequency ratios can be exact, but you can run into harmonic troubles later on. Um, and if you are going to cover many octaves and complicated scales, you need very big integers to represent the note data, but not as big as you might think. So today we're gonna mostly focus on the linear note data. So when you are storing your nodes linearly, that essentially means that all your frequencies will have uh, whole number ratios between them. And actually, there's a name for this in music. It's called just intonation. So it basically means when you are storing your nodes as integers, that just means that you are tuning all your nodes according to the just intonation. So you might see these kind of tables floating on the internet. So how to tune different intervals uh, according to the just intonation. So we're going to cut to the chase and I'm going to just talk about what I think is the best way to do it this in practice. And that's called some, uh, that's something called five limit tuning. So the only intervals you actually need to know for five limit tuning is the perfect octave, it's the two to the one ratio, the perfect fifth, which is um, three to the two ratio, and the major third, which is five to the four ratio. And <clears throat> the tool that will help you to develop a five limit tuning for your notes is called the tonnets. It's basically you imagine an, uh, all the nodes to be an, on an infinite two-dimensional grid. And on this grid, the x-axis, when you move to the right uh, on x-axis, you have frequencies going up by perfect fifths in 3 to the 2 ratio. And on the y-axis, as you move up the y-axis, you have um, frequencies going up by 5 to 4 ratio or major thirds. Now, we can sort of, a, the first thing we point out here is that we, we sort of a forget everything about octaves for now. Um, so if you have a C6 and a C4, they're both C. And the one, of the one reason to forget about the octaves is that um, moving up and down by octave is just multiplying things by two or dividing things by two. And that is actually even easy using a um, on an old-school computer, because that's just a bit shift. So we'll worry about octaves later. And because we're going to ignore the octaves for now, actually it's 5 to the 4 ratio. Instead of thinking it's a 5 to the 4 ratio, you could think of it, in, it as multiply the frequency by 5, and then bring it back by 2 octaves. Similarly, the 3 to the 2 ratio, you can think of it as multiply the uh, frequency by 3 and then bring it down by an octave. So you might just as well arrive at all these conclusions by having the y-axis uh, go up by 5 to 1 ratio or just multiplying frequencies by 5 and uh, the x-axis to multiply the frequencies by 3 or 3 to the 2 or 3 to the 4 or 3 to the 8, doesn't matter. 5 to the 4 could be also considered 5 to the 8, um, or 5 to 2, or whatever. The power of 2 in the denominator, the 4, 
in the 5 to 4 and the 2 in 3 to 2, we can ignore about everything about them for now. We are only worried about the uh, factor of the, 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 the 5 in the numerator and the 3 in the uh, numerator. So now what you do is that you construct all your favorite chords or scales using these intervals. And what you do is that from these tonnets, you find the um, chords or scales, the notes for those ones, by, uh, by moving up or down by perfect fifths in x-axis or up or down major thirds in the y-axis. For example, so for example, the C major triad, you would start with the note C, you would get G by moving uh, a perfect fifth up, and you would get E by moving a major third up. Similarly, to construct a minor triad, you would start, for example, from A, and you would move a perfect fifth up to get an E, and then you would uh, move major third down to get a C. So <clears throat> the key thing here is that all these different chords and scales, they make this kind of funny looking um, Tetris block shape on the tonnets. And the key critical thing is that it really doesn't matter if it's a C major or is it a G major triad or is it a A minor seventh chord, they will always a minor seventh chord will always make the same tetris shape on these tonnets. So now, the kind of uh, integers that give these kind of um, 5 to 4 or 5 to, um, um, 5 to 2 to the power of something ratio on the y-axis and then 3 to, to the power of something ratio on the x-axis, the smallest integer for the various chord shapes um, I've put in the values on this slide. So for a major triad, you would tune it as the root being at the frequency of four, and then the two other notes being at the frequencies of five and six, these are the major, major thirds and the perfect fifths above the root. Um, a minor 7 would be tuned to the ratio of 10, 15, 12, and 9. And now note that <clears throat> um, in these tables, what you're seeing here, I have disregarded about the octaves. So actually, this minor 7 chord that I'm showing here, the root is now, the if it would be, for example, an A minor 7 chord, the A would be at the frequency of 10, but actually the G there, would be at the frequency of 9. But that worry not, because you can move this very easily up by octaves by just multiplying them by 2 to the power of n. So to get so-called different voicing of your chords. So what this table is trying to tell you is that if your node data, if you can only allocate for 3 bits with a just internally tuned uh, note data, you can already make major triads because these fit three bit, bit integers. Minor triads, minor seventh chords, major seventh chords fit four bit integers. With five bits, you have you can develop full pentatonic scales, diminished chords, dominant seventh chords, and augmented chords. And with six bits, you have the full diatonic scale. And this is actually a bit of a surprising or um, interesting result because you might think that how much you can fit in a single byte, but actually because you can fit an entire diatonic scale in, a, in six bits. So with eight bits, you can already have three octaves of diatonic scales, which should be more than enough to develop whatever melody. So even with the frequency-based note data, in practice, I don't think that they will ever raise a situation where you should need uh, more than 8 bits to encode each frequency. Now, how would I um, develop these 
numbers in these tables. So for example, let's try start with the minor seven chord uh, shape over here. So to develop the numbers I just showed before is that you just like put them one to the bottom left cell and then multiply by five when you move up and multiply by three when you move to the right. Then you find the largest value of these uh, cells and then you move all the other cells up by octaves until they are within one octave range of the highest value. So now these all these nodes are within the same octave and they basically make the desired chord uh, shape that they make up the desired chord uh, based on the five limit tuning. You can now move some of these notes up or down if you want. Uh, uh, you can now start moving things up and down by octaves uh, depending on the kind of voicing you want for the chord. Okay, so let's make a simple melody using the minor seventh chord. So the it was the numbers were ten, fifteen, twelve, and nine. So we should make a melody using uh, these frequency values. And let's type something. So we're just going to use the notes from the minor 7 chord. So 10, 15, 12, and 9. I have 12, uh, 10s, 15s, 12s, and 9s, and I, I'm going to hit the 10 a lot because the 10 was the root of the chord. If this would be an A minor 7, this would be, that would be the A. So I hit that a lot, so this sounds to be, um, to sound like this is an A minor. So let's, let's see how it sounds. A very simple melody. A bit high pitched though, so maybe I will drop it down quite a bit. Okay, so so to make it a bit more interesting, we're just gonna move the last note up by one octave. So, we are ready to move to the next part, which is structure and form. And now comes probably that I think what is the most important trick that I've learned over the years for making interesting sounding tiny audio. It's what I call the Brian Eno slash P01 trick. So, in 1978, Brian Eno made a album called Ambient One, Music for Airports, and it consisted of multiple relatively short tape loops of different durations that just kept on looping over and over and again. And even though that each of these tape loops is looping, because they have all of them, the loops had a different duration, and actually the some of these loops did not seem to have the kind of a periodicity as the individual loops. And P01 has used this idea in 2018 in his production called Music for Tiny Airports. It was a 256-byte uh, JavaScript production. And what he had it was just uh, a couple of different notes each of its slightly different lengths and just looping over and over again. So I basically stole this idea from P01, who stole it from Brian Eno. Um, and I have been using it pretty much in every single production ever since I first learned of it. Even if this loop that you're looping uh, is just uh, pitched up versions 
or sped, uh, sped up versions of the same exact loop, it still sounds a lot more interesting. But since uh, you are playing exactly the more or less the same uh, pattern or the same melody in each of these loops, they all of it will kind of work work out harmonically. So let's do exactly that in the byte beep tool. So instead of having just nine partials, now we will have uh, J loops. Um, so we have a J running from one to um, up to, let's say, two at first. So we have two different loops. And the row, here's the critical thing, we, we sort of multiply that by j. So the, the second loop is moving two times faster than the first loop. So we can slow things down a little bit. And now, these, you could think of these as two different channels. These two different channels are operating, um, are, are, are playing in the exact same frequency range, but we could move also the second channel, like let's say um, up by an octave. So just multiply the frequency by J. And let's add one more channel or a loop to the whole thing. Okay, so it's a bit busy now. So let's actually slow it down a little bit more even. So let's divide by the two. And I think it's a bit clipping, so. So I should mention here probably that when we are multiplying the frequency plus j, the, the first loop is um, playing notes at the frequency of f, the second um, loop is pre playing notes at the frequency of 2 times f, so 1 octave up, and the third loop is playing notes at the frequency of 3 times f, so it's actually 1 octave and a perfect fifth up. So we are not only actually playing any more just the nose of a minor seventh chord, but also um, another minor seventh chord, which is perfect fifth above the original minor seventh chord. But actually, if you work out what notes those are, you will still find out that we are actually hitting something like um, six different nodes of the diatonic uh, scale. So it's all kind of sounds pretty okay to our Western ear still. Okay, so next up, now we, ha we are starting having a pretty interesting sounding uh, pattern that has something going on harmonic harmonically, and uh, um, there's a bit of a rhythm also there. So next up, what we're going to talk about a little bit is about chord progressions. So. The basic chord progression, the one, four, five chord progression, or um, in majors or ma minor minors, um, is you can think of it as just moving the entire chord, the to tonic, up by a perfect fourth or a perfect fifth. So let's say you would have a C major triad. So if you just move this triad up by a perfect fourth, you would get an F major triad, and if you would move the C major up by a perfect fifth, 
uh, you would get the G major triad. So this would be basically that you can transform your chord, for example, C major, into a four chord or a five chord by just multiplying by this um, integer whole number ratio. But instead of multiplying the ratio, we're going to have multiply these frequencies just by uh, values 6, 8, and 9 in the first place. So 6 is the tonic, 8 is the 4 chord, and 9 is the 5 chord. And the reason this works out is because the ratio of 8 to 6 is 4 to 3, a perfect fourth, and the ratio of 9 to 6 is 3 to 2, a perfect fifth. So <clears throat> let's add a simple 1, 4, 5 chord progression, actually a minor chord progression in our case to our song now. So we're just gonna multiply this frequency by six, six, eight, different values, six of six, eight or nine, depending on the time. So let's, uh, every four seconds we change the chord and take the modulo uh, four by doing and. And I think, So you can see that there's a, there's simple chord progression going on um, in this uh, in this song now. So we could speed it up, and actually sometimes actually doing the chord progression kind of very fast is makes interesting results, so that you don't have time to establish uh, that there's a the actual chord change, but it sounds more like the melody is just going uh, a little bit more interesting places. So let's speed it up a bit. I think we have um, something uh, reasonably interesting going on so far, and now we can start playing around with the sound um, to tune it. For example, one thing that I have to do is that instead of having the partials running at integer multiples now returning to the synthesizer and the sounds, you could have them uh, running at the i to the power of 2, so i times i uh, intervals. So the first uh, oscillator is running at frequency 1, second at frequency 4 times the fundamental frequency, and the next oscillator running at 9 times the fundamental frequency. And what you get... get this kind of a completely different sound uh, that sounds a lot about uh, sounds a lot like uh, a bell and um, <clears throat> one thing you could do is you could add a simple delay buffer to it so when uh, t is equal to zero we initialize the delay buffer into an empty value and then at every time we save the um, we save the sample output to the delay buffer, and we also pull. So it's a it's a ring buffer. So we also pull a slight little bit of the of the um, sample values back from the delay buffer, and because. It could be a null value, we're gonna just gonna coerce it to zero if it's a null value. So I think as a of the few effects, if you can only do one effect, I usually the only one effect I'm gonna add to sound is, is delay. It adds so much um, to the whole whole thing and it masks the um, 
individual notes because of the feedback. So at this point, at this point, I would now start to actually do the composing of, a, of an actual song, meaning I would start to play around with the chord progressions. I would start to play around with the patterns, change the pattern. Now we just had a one pattern here. Um, but I think that the, um, the, the problem with that is that I have not really found very good ways to do that you have using some kind of mathematical equations so uh, so far what i have been uh, usually doing is that i then just i have i tabulate i use some kind of a array based data to to drive these chord uh, changes and then change the pattern like i have a, like an order list for a tracker or something like that so that's why the last few slides i'm going to talk about just about the tools that i've developed for this purpose. So the tool I'm going to introduce is called Crackle Tracker, which I developed for TIC80 and for making music for TIC80 tiny intros. Mostly I've been using to make it use, using it to make uh, music for 512 byte intros, but I've also used it for a 256 byte intro. And this is the song from Crackle uh, Crackle Bass. So you can see that when I hit play. Um, the channel number zero, the red cursor over there, it's starting to play a particular pattern. Um, and it's looping it all over and over again. And soon the channels two and three will kick in, and they're playing other patterns, but they're playing at half the speed of the channel number zero. So it doesn't sound to be looping quite as badly as it would be if it would be um, just playing Then we slightly change the patterns being played by all these channels to keep things interesting. This is defined by the order list. And soon, soon the channel number one will kick in, and that will that will give you a low bass notes, and it's playing them very, very slowly. And now the whole thing sounds to be repeating only. Uh, when the orange cursor uh, repeats. Then we do chord progressions. So this is actually we went from one chord to the four chord and uh, to the five chord. And we do just do this simply by adding a uh, certain number of semitones in this case to all the note values being played in this song. So the uh, five semitones is basically a perfect four up and enough seven semitones. So this is just a simple example how the Brian Neno uh, slash P01 trick can get you incredible mileage out of a few simple patterns and uh, order list uh, to vary things around. So to summarize, this seminar is, is what's supposed to be more like a call to arms. If music is the art of arranging sound to create some combination of uh, rhythm, melody, harmony, and form, so let's try to make tiny intros with music, with actual music, with something going on there rhythmically, melodically, harmonically, and, and there's some kind of a structure and form to the songs that we play. So, so I thank you for your attention, and here are some links and references. If you're looking for how to make sounds on various platforms, Sidescoding.org, Wiki is your friend. The ByteBeat tools, uh, I use the Dolchan ByteBeat tool, and then you have the, also the fantastic Gregman ByteBeat tool. Um, about the P01 or Brian Eno trick, you should read P01's uh, write-up about the music for tiny air airports, and Crackle Tracker you can download for GitHub. So, thank you, and enjoy your love bite.